Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome. Thank God it's Monday. And welcome to Manufacturing Monday Motivation. We are here live. Damon, hey, did you go to a baseball game yesterday? Yes, I did. How yes, was it? Was it was awesome. What, what, it was son? awesome. I tell you what, it, we lost the game, but it was awesome. And it, it's a big, a big turning point in my family. It's the first time my son actually bought me tickets to go to a baseball son game. Son bought you tickets. And so, yeah, Avery and I know you've got, you can look forward to this with your seven year old. So, all right, let's take a deep dive, Damon. So glad you had an awesome weekend. What a turning point as a dad. Your son bought you first tickets to the Seattle Mariners. So, yeah. even though they didn't win, it was still a wonderful bonding experience. Yes, us. it was. Congratulations. I'm still enjoying macaroni necklaces. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're that's good stuff, though. Enjoy that's good yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it does. All right, guys, let's dig into an intro here. So it is my honor. It's my privilege. I've been looking forward to this for months. I believe it's been several months. So I want to introduce everybody to Abrin Clemens. He is with the MEP in, in Rhode Island. And so that is a Polaris MEP. He's a workforce expert, workforce specialist. So Aaron, happy Monday, my friend. Welcome. And uh, tell us a little bit what's going on in your world today. Indeed. Fantastic to be here. I am uh, hot off the road, traveling, having seen some family this past weekend. So nice. uh, mind is is a buzz getting back into the office and uh, and working during this this kind of summertime ebb and flow with manufacturers. You know, everyone wants a little bit of vacation squeezed in there. You know, but we all collectively have a lot of work to do together. So um, yeah, it's it's full speed ahead. Well, let's let's take a deep dive here. So a few things I, I tell you, Damon. Just you know, Aaron's very modest, but I just want to share a few things, Damon. You're going to be blown away here. So Aaron, plug your ears, and we're going to talk all about you for a minute here. But you know, emerging leader of the year for the Rhode Island Hospitality and Tourism Association. You're the champion of the adult learning from the United Way. You're part of the new uh, new leaders council. Graduate from Johnson and Wales. And so, and I'll tell you, man, you are just, uh, you know, conversations with you, you're doing amazing work as a workforce specialist at the Polaris MEP. So let's, uh, here's my, my first question for you today. Are you yeah. sitting down for this one? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. You are such a wonderful success at such a bright young age. As a, as a young man growing up, or I'm going to go back further, little boy growing up, who was your hero growing up? Who was your who was your hero that inspired you to be just such a relentless force of energy? Who was that hero in your world? Yeah. So, thank you. First of all, um, I don't I don't know if it's uh, if it's modesty that I feel when I hear these compliments, but uh, <laughs> but my therapist would say to just take them. So thank you very much for that introduction. <laughs> just hug them. That's right. Exactly. Just like, just feel them all. Um, my hero growing up and still as a driving force is uh, is my mother, and not because I'm an only child mother's boy when I was raised, but um, I truly had an example of um, you know trying. Right. Um, I try to not go too deep into the bootstrapping, work hard, and all will come to you. Right. But um, trying, trying your best, uh, making some plans, following through on them, and then pivoting as is necessary, right? But just consistent trying uh, to some end will help you move forward, right? You can't always see where you're going as much as you hope things are clear and, and you don't always know what will be ahead, but trying will always move you some direction forward. And uh, watching my mother graduate with her master's the same year I graduated high school nice. really shows you, right? Um, awesome. Rather than being told you're supposed to go to college, it shows you why college works for her, right? Why she chose that step, right? Um, watching her get her her degree in education and moving on and growing and now being a director of centers herself, right? And also making several lateral moves within just education as a field, um, trying, doing, right? Um, really, really framed a lot of how I thought about um, options, you know, finding options, investigating, analyzing, and, and deciding what was next for me just as a right next step, you know, just do do the best next thing, right? Always really worked for me. Man, you know what? I, you Usually we have like- Do a the best next thing. Do, do the, the best, best, next, best thing. next thing. I like that. I think, you know, usually we have like a little moment of silence through like when people do those mic drop moments, Aaron, you know, usually it's like a little bit later in the program. This, I think, Damon, this was the first, the earliest moment of silence that we had in the program. Yep. 
So <laughs> do the best next thing. What's mom's name? Sharon. Sharon. Well, hey, God bless Sharon for all the, the drive and what she produced here and such a fine young man. So, hey, we want to give a shout out and a big hello to Sharon. So send her our best. That's the best thing, man. I Indeed. love that. Give her flowers. <laughs> give her flowers while she can still smell them. Absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's dig in. So you go off to college and you decide, man, you're going to uh, take your talents, your skills and bring them into, you started off with a hospitality direction. Is that correct? Or well, I did. And, you know, I went to college here at Johnson and Wales. I transferred in for a uh, small business management and entrepreneurship degree, yep. uh, knowing that I needed some sort of skills behind me um, to realize some of the, the dreams, the interests, you know, the goals that I had. I, I knew I needed the skills. Um, I knew even at that stage that I didn't want to run with the sharks, you know, um, yeah. I knew I needed to find, find a pond to swim in that was comfortable for me. Um, yeah. and someplace I, I had some space to learn, you know, to look around and, uh, pick up skills. So, um, everything about transferring over to Johnson and Wales was the perfect move for me. Nice. Um, nice. Whether I knew it at the time or not. So nice. after, so after graduating, let's take, let's, uh, take a little dive into like, what was going on with your career, your thoughts? How did you get started? What were your ambitions? What, and, and how I want to, then we'll lead up to like how you got your, found yourself into manufacturing. So yeah. what was going on? Like, you know, fresh out of college, you're going to conquer the world. What was happening there? Mm -hmm. Fresh out of college. I wanted to change the world. Sure. <laughs> as young upstart graduates do. Um, and I found myself uh, with bills to pay and yes. uh, right, and, and a life that needed living. So I, I quickly found um, that I was a people person. My mother used to refer to me as a social butterfly. Um, and I realized that nice. I had some benefit there. I realized that it had some benefit um, that um, I was able to maintain whatever was going on inside emotionally. I could essentially find a place for myself in just about any room I was in, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whether I was on the complete outside of whatever core group was in that room or whether or not I was surrounded with like-minded folks, I could always find a way to appear comfortable in every room and, and pick something up. Um, so that served me well. In, in the hospitality industry. I was other, able to make other people feel equally as comfortable, whether I was a server, uh, moving on to becoming a manager of a place, right? Um, I found early success in curating a lot of events and experiences, right? So early on, um, I became a DJ of a venue that I was also nice. a supervisor at, right? And that came out of uh, not, not any notions of superstardom, um, but in, it came out of a need to curate the space and curate the energy and um you know the experience for folks coming into the space um i recognize yeah. that the background music we had on wasn't doing it right it wasn't meeting the same quality level that our product was that our staff was after all of the training right that that needed attention too um so i began making mixes to be played in the space and then moved on to live djing during key moments friday saturday nights and things like that booking so wow. early early you know while still in college success um exploring that side of things um but really really nice. cool experiences well i love that so that, I mean, a couple of things i want to hit on real quick there so as you talked about like you know being comfortable in every situation and so you yeah. know what I'm hearing, you know, hey, you're an ex extrovert, but not only extrovert was that confidence level. I usually don't go here and I usually don't talk about this, but I, I feel compelled to. Can you talk a little bit about like what, you know, when you're young, 20s, college, whatever, sometimes we're awkward, we're around, uh, you know, other folks, maybe folks that aren't like us or what have you. What do you feel? What was what was behind that confidence level that you brought into the into your work uh, workplace? You know, I had very little actual confidence, but I had the ability, um, I had the ability to really tap into what I knew was a true worth. I had little confidence that yeah, yeah, yeah. other people understood my worth. But again, watching, watching a woman, you know, raise me in such a fashion that she made her own worth undeniable. I yeah. recognize that whatever one might think of the, the external forces. I knew my own worth and knew that I could find ways to leverage it um, and, you know, to make it apparent to other people. So I had very little actual bravado in these spaces at the yeah. time. Um, but I knew how to, 
I knew how to stay quiet, look around, build connections, make relationships in honest ways with folks. Um, and that's something that served me well. I was able to make honest, real relationships with people because I believed, even before I understood the terminology of it all, I believed in meeting people where they were at right? and, and moving together in whatever direction you two decide to move together into. But um, meeting folks where they're at is a really, really important part of uh, running any business and of relationship building in any way is, is um, meeting folks right where they're at. It's, it's a skill. Yeah. Um, and Dan, let me, the, let me, let me, like, let me, let me peg it. Made my worth undeniable. Yeah. Made, like mic drop moment number two. And what are we we're like? We're 10 minutes into this thing, you know, yeah. made my worth undeniable. Damon, what, what, what's your takeaway on that? Well, I just think that I, I listened to you tell your story about when you're in college and then you started to realize that you needed to, that, that DJing and, the right music sets so the right atmosphere sets so the right energy level it is so important when you look at these events and what you were doing to really understand energy level and and atmosphere and everything and how music really helps that and um that you that you took the initiative and really walked through that and did it it's it's uh because it does, it does. It, and you can set, and that's why DJ gets it. People go, Whoa, oh, why do DJs get paid? They get paid to make sure that the place is having a good time. And you may not even like the music that you're playing, but if everybody there is having a good time, yep. you're doing your job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I, and, you know, I love in that hospitality. Feeling. That's the difference between success and failure because they keep coming back or they go tell their friends they had a great experience. It's a huge determination in how you're going to succeed or fail. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I, I love that. So guys, if, if boy, if you're out there, so Margo drops a hello. Good morning, Cargo Margo. Thank you for joining hey, us today. Guys, we're here today with Aaron Clemens, and he's with the Polaris MEP. That's the MEP of Rhode Island. Please drop us a note. Let us know you're here. You want to absolutely uh, make a connection here with Aaron. And so let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to continue this conversation a little bit further. And what I love is we talk about so many manufacturers where, you know, how often do we hear manufacturers says, oh, I'm a commodity, I'm a commodity. And what I, you know, you know, boy, I just, I really wish that they would uh, have a different mindset when they say that. And what I love what you're talking about here is, you know, as a DJ, boy, I can't be a commodity. Like, you know, you need to get, you know, fired up. You need to, you know, when you're in that customer service, when you're in that hospitality world, you really need to fire things up. So let's talk a little uh, further in your career as we lead up to your decision to bring your skills, your talents, your expertise, your superpowers to the world of manufacturing. Anything else that you want to touch on in your career? Any other highlights that you want to share before we take a dive into manufacturing? I do. I do. I want to make that connection. Um, so we get yeah, here, we get to how I found manufacturing, because as I said earlier, I enjoy um, things that provide access and opportunity. Um, I recognize that I needed to be surrounded by people that were going to afford me access and opportunity early on. And I've worked to a place where I can now afford others access and opportunity. Um, I, I worked to what was a personal height for myself, um, managing the Dean Hotel locally here in Providence. I've uh, met um, an individual who has since become a very important mentor for me in my life, both uh, professionally and personally, um, sharing those same values about access and opportunity for everybody that we have the privilege of uh, working with and managing. Um, that height uh, brought me to the place where I realized um, I cared less for glitz, glam, uh, fancy plates, you know, or uh, fancy accommodations, right? I, I cared less mm -hmm. for that on a daily basis um, than I did for taking care of people and uh, making sure they felt that they were working to their best, right? Meeting them where they were at, right? To build standards together and making sure they felt like they were working at their best and working in a direction that they were seeing the growth that they wanted to see in themselves, right? And, and feeling mm -hmm. like they had the resources and opportunity, the access um, to realize their own potential. So I also began doing some uh, coaching for first-time managers after receiving that uh, leadership award uh, and reaching that height, uh, led me to consider what other industries would allow me to work to promote access and opportunity. And manufacturing is it, boy. In this state, 
uh, hospitality and manufacturing are actually two of the biggest driving forces economically, um, both in terms of number of individual businesses operating in those industries and number of employees. Um, both of them are two huge driving factors in the state. Um, so it actually wound up being a lateral move for me that um, very few people understood um, yeah. because they were focused on mm -hmm. you know, what do you know about manufacturing, but Polaris MEP understood um, exactly what I knew, which was admittedly little about manufacturing, but very much so about creating access and opportunity for other people to access manufacturing. Um, so yeah. it was a fantastic lateral move. Well, that's perfect. So let's do this. Let's uh, for anybody out there that might be new to the MEP, they're like, "Hey guys, what mm -hmm. you guys keep talking about this MEP thing? What are you talking about?" So, Abraham, could you please just let's uh, let's describe what the ME just uh, do an introduction for everybody. What is the MEP Manufacturing Extension Partnership? And then what I want to do is then I want to slide. I want to take a deeper dive on what truly attracted you and how your journey led into uh, to Polaris and into manufacturing. But what is this MEP network that we're chatting about today? Absolutely, absolutely. You said it, you said it with the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. It took me about uh, three, maybe four months to get that right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> year, so the, you're, you're way ahead of me. <laughs> Money, extension program, and then all sorts of different things. Yeah, yeah. There, it is indeed the Manufacturing Extension Partnership um, that is the federal program uh, that manages uh, manufacturing uh, improvement centers across the country. So the example that I like to give is that whenever the current president of the day, whoever they are, um, gives you their speech and says they're going to strengthen American manufacturing, right? They sign a bill on TV and you see that money present, you see the signing and you wonder where is it going? this is one of the main places it's going, right? Yeah. Uh, it's in NIST, right? The federal office that manages this money and flows it down to the MEP center in each state, of which there is one designated for each state, as well as one in Puerto Rico, as there are colonies. So um, there is a center that is entrusted to manage and be an advisor and almost a personal assistant to the entirety of the manufacturing industry in that state. So that we're meant to be responsive. So each MEP doesn't operate exactly the same because, mm -hmm. you know, the industry in each state is not exactly the same. Each MEP is tasked with being very responsive to what that state needs. And that's why um, here in, in our MEP, we have such a strong workforce department, um, which is truly the two of us, Lindsay and myself. Yes. Um, but I'm very proud of the work we've been able to do because it is a huge demonstrated need, uh, the need for workforce development in manufacturing in the state. Um, so we're very responsive to those needs. Yeah. That's perfect. So what- just Great explanation. Yeah. yeah, great, great explanation. Just a recap for anybody out there. So if you happen to be in the great state of Rhode Island, boy, you absolutely want to connect with Aaron. You want to connect with Aaron no matter where you are. But secondly, if your manufacturer out there, regardless of what state you're in, as he just mentioned, these are tax dollars to at work for manufacturers throughout the entire country. There's an MEP in all 50 states. And, you know, one of our favorite words is, you just mentioned it, you know, that trusted guide, trusted resource uh, to help manufacturers with all sorts of different scopes. And we're going to take a deeper dive there. So, all right, we have a nice explanation of what that MEP network is for folks out there. So, Aaron, let's talk about, okay, so you're just crushing it. You're, bring, again, bringing your talents, your skills, your superpowers to hospitality, and you decide, hey, man, this manufacturing world might be for me. Talk about that transition and how did Polaris come on your radar? Like, what was the appeal like? You know, man, I think this might be a good fit. Share yeah. that story with us. Yeah. Indeed, um, access and opportunity, quality of life is that third quality piece. Of life. Quality of life is extremely important, and that's one thing that the manuf I'm sorry that the hospitality industry still needs to catch up to. Yeah. Our, um, it's it's harder than it sounds. Is um, structures and and a way to build their companies, their operations, to promote the same level of quality of life you know, that, that is at the same quality level as the plates they're putting out and drinks they're preparing, right? Um, so all of that glitz and glam on the outside 
again, on the outside, that customer's experience, right? There needs to be the same attention and resource given, right, to what the employee experiences, right? So it's an industry that doesn't often provide healthcare, right? And so I, I can't point to one single restaurant, right, as falling behind, right? I can't point to one single hotel as falling behind on that, right? Um, it's an industry-wide thing that hospitality still has to catch up to building companies in a way that they can offer a high quality of life to their employees, right? Um, I needed that. I have a seven-year-old child who, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if he needs me more than I need him or vice versa. But, um, you know, the lessons that I learn from him every day uh, remind me, you know, remind me of the time and attention um, that that needs to be spent, um, you know, with with our next generation. And so I needed a shift into something that would allow me to explore creating access and opportunity deeper and allow me a quality of life to be able to pick up my son from school if he wasn't feeling well. Yeah. Right? And that and that not be a point of shame. Right. Or yeah. be be a point where I was concerned about uh, leaving my peers in the lurch without my presence because we were working at a point where we were stretched so thin. Mm -hmm. Right. That any one person's presence. Right. Being taken from the team leaves right. the rest of the team in the lurch. So there's a lot of shame and guilt that comes along with working in the hospitality industry, even when you have a company that is actively trying to do right by its employees, yeah. which I've been yeah. fortunate enough to work with companies that that have the utmost respect for me, right? Um, that that I still go to as a customer, that I still refer people to jobs at because I do respect um, how the company manages itself. Um, but again, there's a certain amount of guilt when you're leaving your coworkers behind, mm -hmm. right? Because you need to manage something in your personal life. And that's something that, um, that I needed in a company and Polaris MEP is a hundred percent as you know puts 100 percent importance in uh staff well-being just as much as we truly mean it when we say we are going to try our best for our local you know small to medium manufacturers um right. polaris MEP truly tries its best and it's just evident every day awesome so let's talk all right so while we're on the topic of polaris let's dig into your team i know you have a rock star director i yeah, i've met aaron on your team so mm -hmm. let's Oh, so a uh, manufacturer in Rhode Island, they're like, hey, who's behind the curtain, Aaron? So I'm, I'm meeting you. Who else is, uh, who are some of these other superstars? So let's talk a little bit about your team and, and the expertise that you guys bring to the table here. Yeah, we are a small group, small but mighty. Yeah. Um, we have our center director who you met, um, a rock star, Kathy Mahoney. Yep. Um, that trickles on down to uh, Sarah Reggio, who manages a handful of project managers. I won't name each, mm -hmm. but We've yep. got about five project managers that go out extremely hands-on and will help you to deduce the issue that you're facing, um, make sure it's clear, make sure you have clear recommendations for how we can help you, and then actually execute those things, right? So those project managers are probably, probably a 60-40 split, if I had to say it. 60% of what we do are those project managers helping you to figure out <laughs> how we can help you the right way mm -hmm. and then actually helping you right and then that 40 percent of workforce as a department right um executing with the same top line bottom line pipeline strategy in place which is one of our unspoken taglines right we we seek to help rhode island manufacturers with top line bottom line and pipeline strategies nice. um clearly nice. workforce is is the huge driver of pipeline uh and so we have our director of marketing, Aaron, who you met, yep. um, and other folks on the marketing team who helped me set up this lovely Zoom and banner here today, yep. uh, this lovely stream. So um, we have a really small but mighty team. Um, if I could go into a little bit more depth on please. the project managers. Yeah, please um, do. Because I, it, it's been amazing to watch them work um, and, and to watch how they approach what they do. Um, because it's great being in a place where it's it's not our job to sell you on what we do. It's our job to deliver on what we do, truly. Um, so an easy to understand example that, that I witnessed firsthand that I take with me is, um, you know, a manufacturer 
hitting a certain production level where they now believe they need a larger space, right? That's great for the industry, right? Great for the state. That means a larger space. That means more, more room to make more money. That means you're likely going to have to hire more employees. We can help you with all of that. We have a specialist on staff who helps with facility layouts. He is, he is the most entertaining nerd about <laughs> blueprints and facilities layout, right? It is fantastic to watch and so invigorating. Um, and the first thing he does before selling you on allowing him to help you lay out your shiny new facility, the first thing he does is he does a deep dive into how you're using your current space. Yeah. Because nine times out of 10, you can actually improve output from your current space and don't need to pay more rent to make more money, mm -hmm. right? And that to me shows exactly what it means to be a trusted advisor, right? It's not, it's not his job to sell you right on a shiny new service when what he can actually do is provide you a solution right that works with what you're already dealing with right so let's increase yeah. that top line right let's increase that efficiency so that that bottom line flow through is even better that's how you're making more money truly right yep. without having to spend more right always mm -hmm. so um it's examples like that 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 really just bring home how such a small but mighty team you know, really puts the needs of the manufacturers first. And it's just, again, amazing to watch every day. Yeah. Isn't, awesome. What a blessing it is when you have just a, a team that you respect, you admire, you're in awe of. And again, how admirable it is that what you do as a function is helping manufacturers be more efficient, make more money, you know, better workforce, uh, marketing, whatever that, you know, flavor is. And even though you guys have a small team, you know, you have access to 49 other states plus Puerto Rico of, right. you know, yeah. really hundreds of other you know rock stars in manufacturing that That's can right. that you can pull in plus you know damon we know some of the folks at nist you know so there's cybersecurity and we could go on and on so and aaron speaking of aaron, aaron reed is here with us today so look at this nice on the stage there there's aaron aaron happy monday thank you for putting us together we're having a blast and so all right aaron let's take a deep dive let's talk about you it's all about you right <laughs> Workforce development. I'll tell you the conversation that you and I had, I was just completely mesmerized, blown away. Just, you know, some of the things that you have going on. Can you just share with the folks, you know, what, what are some of the things that they would expect working with Polaris or yourself or whatever state that they might be? What are some of the tactic strategies that you're implementing or helping manufacturers on that workforce front? Mm -hmm. So an important thing to remember with individuals watching this today is that uh, Polaris MEP's workforce division is not a placement agency. Yeah, right? thank you. Mm -hmm. um, again, we're responsive to manufacturers. So what we do is a combination of uh, long-term tactics and very short-term tactics. In the long term, uh, we are polling, meeting with, mm -hmm. visiting, and getting very hands-on to learn about what manufacturers need from today's near futures and very far futures workforce, right? One need that became very clear uh, was the need for CNC machinists, right? Um, we were able to put together a training program along with CCRI as a partner that has now uh, gone through 16 cohorts, right? Uh, very effectively getting folks to work and um, we've been able to put folks through that paid training, right? Again, meeting them where they're at, right? Allowing folks um, who have various levels of machining knowledge from none to some to lots, right? But wanting to make a lateral move and get into CNC machining particularly, right? Or any entry level machining role, really. Um, we've been able to put 16 cohorts through that program and into really meaningful jobs. Um, so nice. yeah mm -hmm. go ahead David. well that's that i mean this is a great example of how working together with MEPs, working together with the industry you can create a, an overall program mm -hmm. that fills a need that virtually everyone has across the industries that you serve. so that's long term creating yeah training programs that get large amounts of people in due time into the industry right really yeah. open up that funnel when we talk about the pipeline mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. The direct placement that we do indeed do is uh, also building relationships with various partners, um, both on the state level, uh, community organizations, 
um, who serve as a referral point to us for folks who are mechanically inclined and ready to get to work. So yeah. I am a placement agency, but only for my manufacturers. Right, right? that's the point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any manufacturer in the state, whether we've done any level of business with them otherwise, um, is welcome to contact me. I'm sure you're going to have my contact email details mm -hmm. available to share uh, in the chat or, or details of the stream. But there, any and all are welcome to contact me to learn about uh, programs that we have available um, to to help you get qualified folks into your roles, um, to help you with uh, grant strategies, um, to help you train your incumbent workforce, and to help you uh, retain and grow that, that incumbent workforce. We, we have uh, so many options that it actually can become sometimes a little bit daunting to give someone a two minute elevator speech uh, because there's so many possibilities um, mm -hmm. of how we can help. Yeah. Well, and it's 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 really these long term I mean, manufacturing that everybody talks about the labor shortage. Right. And and we know that we know we need people. We know we need we know we need people. We know we need to be as diverse as we possibly can, because we just we it, it's not only is it right, it's, it's we need that to get to get the workers uh, mm -hmm. that 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 are, are required to fill the roles, because honestly, a lot of manufacturers don't have enough people to do what they need to do right now. Mm -hmm. And they're stretching their people thin. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the thing. So my question was around, what do you think is the biggest workforce challenge for manufacturers in Rhode Island right now? Just not just hiring, but deeper than that. What is the, yeah. the biggest thing that you see them struggling to do? Yeah, we got to hire, but what's, what is yeah. it really that's hitting them? Um, the entirety of the industry um, across the country also holds true for Rhode Island. Uh, the biggest challenge is rebranding, or I suppose even branding manufacturing in the first place as a fantastic career with a wide set of opportunities. Um, and a small addendum to that is eliminating the conversation of college or work, uh, because it's, it's not an either or, particularly in this industry, it's a yes and. Right. Again, that next best step. Right. The next best step for some is indeed college. For some, it is indeed work. But neither has to cancel out the opportunity of the other at any stage. Uh, many of the Man. many of the yeah. companies that that retain folks right in the state have already recognized that and have fantastic marketing around what makes a career with their organization, right? One. Two, they've invested in that educational well-being of their employees and have opportunities for employees to learn and grow, not just vertically, right? Because everyone is aware of how to climb a ladder, but horizontally, right? Laterally. They, they make lateral moves possible for folks who like that example of our CNC training program for folks who perhaps have been in one department at the company for a handful of years and want to learn machining, right? And that might be a lateral move. It might not be an increase mm -hmm. in pay yet, but if it is an increase in satisfaction for that employee that they're learning and growing both personally and professionally in a new skill set, it's absolutely worth that company's uh, investment in that employee. Um, we see it time and time again that uh, retention, retention, is is such a better strategy right than being the hot new ticket you know for new hires um to hit a revolving door of folks right uh, because yeah. when when you become only about the paycheck right um you are setting yourself up for a scenario where the next paycheck will beat you out right the next mm -hmm. dollar up the road will beat you out because that's all you've made clear to the employee is a benefit to them to be there. Um, your job descriptions, your upfront communication needs to make clear, right, that this is a the beginning of a career in manufacturing for you. And I truly believe in them. It's, it's been a year of me learning about these career pathways. And they, like you said, Damon, they, they make so many, there's so many connections to how I viewed upward mobility and lateral moves within the hospitality industry. Um, it, it seems just amazing to me that we haven't capitalized on branding manufacturing for what it is, right? We have, like I said earlier, folks who make 
small jewelers who make the trophy for the Kentucky Derby every year, right? We have folks locally making kimchi, kombucha, and all sorts of snacks and edibles, right? Manufacturers. We have folks making, you know, specific screws that go on the space station, right? <laughs> that they serve NASA. We have folks locally that make parts for vehicles that are quite literally in every vehicle make and model, right? Um, so again, they're, they're in the lives. The things that are made here in Rhode Island are in the lives of Rhode Islanders and all Americans, right? Across the board, across the board. That, that I mean, that that is sort of the definition for the potential for a career, right? The yeah. amount of different things you can do, the amount of lateral moves and the amount of room to, to grow vertically, um, it's exponential. And um, we've unfortunately done a poor job as a country of moving past the idea that that manual labor is grunt work, right? Because we've made it again, and either you, you go an intellectual college route or you go to trade school and do grunt work when in fact they are one in the same as the next best step for you, right? Um, and they can, they can absolutely work in tandem. Um, our training program, for example, um, I'll end on this. Um, that CNC training program um, offers by design 13 credits, right? I told you it's in tandem with CCRI. It offers 13 college credits. You graduate with that certification, right? That is an industry recognized mm -hmm. certification in machining, but you also graduate with 13 credits, just a few credits shy of an associate's degree, right? Which makes you now just a certain amount of credits shy of completing a bachelor's, right? The mm -hmm. best companies leverage that, right? You're, you're bringing someone into the company that has made an investment in their growth and knowledge base, and you can now complete that investment, right? By helping with tuition remission towards finishing a bachelor's. And you, you can't buy that kind of loyalty, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? right? Another dollar wouldn't buy you that level of loyalty yes. say, um, that you get from a company, from, a, from an individual that has their investment reciprocated and matched, right? Um, yeah. It's, just, yeah. Yeah, it's a huge, I, it's a huge thing. It's just, you, there's so much there, Kurt. I don't even know where to start. Yeah, there's so much unpack. What you just, <laughs> I was so glad to just let you go. First off, I think the best thing to do would maybe. All right, so when you're listening to this, or when you get done, this, there's yeah. a little like, you know, like I'm an older guy, so I would say hit the rewind button for. Remember the old cassettes, Damon. So instead of hitting the rewind button, just kind of like move that little thing back and just like re, like listen to that again. There was just so much gold right there, so. Aaron, I want to drop our friend Aaron. Just she said, "Hey, if folks are interested in the fast track and CNC uh, manufacturing program that Aaron just described, it's right here at this link. So again, it's right here on LinkedIn in the chat box. Guys, we're on YouTube Live, we're on Twitter Live. So first off, you have to connect with Aaron on LinkedIn. First off, check out the Polaris website, Polaris MEP, and you're going to find out all sorts of this uh, great information." We can't let go past on this program, Damon, we talk about this a lot. We love talking about women in manufacturing, diversity manufacturing, and we love yep. talking about all the cool kids are now going into manufacturing, right? Yeah. And you just kind of recap that. And what nobody has ever said on this program, it doesn't have to be an either or. Dude, you just like you gave me yeah. skills. I don't have to go to college or I have to go, you know, all three of our mothers here, we have something in common. All three of our mothers went back to college in a non-traditional age and God bless them. They've done amazing. You know, we have, they, all three of them are our heroes. So again, you don't, just because you don't want to go to college right out of high school, it doesn't mean anything negative. Mike Womack at the New Jersey MEP, mutual friend of ours, he always says, let's get rid of the white collar, blue collar thing. It's just like, yeah, hey, we yeah. have collars and we're going to work. Some of us don't wear a collar, you know? Yeah. So, uh, th so all right, let's talk about this, Aaron. Let's take it another step further. We were talking a little bit. That there's, man, there's so much I want to talk about right now. We were talking about like that customer service aspect with your expertise, you know, being in hospitality and like, you know, some manufacturers, you know, God bless our manufacturers. Maybe over the years, they've dealt with just a handful of, uh, of customers mm -hmm. where they didn't need to have like a real strong customer service department per se. But, mm -hmm. and we want we were going to talk about that before we get into that. What, what a big takeaway for me is what you're talking about is like, we need to have like a customer service department for 
that attraction for retention for workforce. So we almost need to have kind of that customer uh, service, that customer wow factor and treat our, it's a little different bit of a mindset. We almost need to treat our customers like their employees and exactly like you're saying, how can I retain them beyond, you know, Hey, that one dot, if I'm a commodity, somebody pays me 50 cents more a dollar uh, an hour more, I'm going up the road. Talk a little bit about your customer service expertise or like what are some other like any other specific strategies that you want to talk about that you see that customer that manufacturers are just uh, really crushing it of like uh, attracting, retaining and uh, uh, obtaining uh, new new uh, new staff. So so in this industry, the way um, most of the companies are structured, um, those efforts are usually being championed by HR. Right. Mm -hmm. Sources. And if you look at that term right? They're viewing humans as a resource, resource for the company, right? Um, you know, language is important in terms of, uh, you know, how it frames, right? The rules that we're applying to mm -hmm. that term, right? So we're, we're agreeing that humans are a resource for the company. So, okay. So we're saying they're more than labor, right? Which is the term commonly used before, right? They're labor. No, they're more than labor. They're humans. They're, they're a resource to be used some would argue that calling humans a resource means they're meant to be used to depletion right um and that's not the case and that's often what the best human resource directors have already come to realize without having a new term for it um without having a new buzzword they realize that the goal here is not to deplete this resource right um mm -hmm. so human resources is usually the one leading the charge on creating programs um, to attract and, and working in tandem with marketing when companies are lucky enough to have someone like an Aaron Reed um, who can help distill big ideas down to palpable messages. Um, they're usually the ones leading the charge and understanding that for one, being flexible with something as small as how a, a, an employee is able to access a healthcare plan, right? Um, you know, flexible spending accounts these days are a really big deal. And that flexible is the most important part of that, right? Um, the ability to be flexible with how you address your needs, because if you're meeting people where they're at, you recognize that different people have different needs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they can all perform up to whatever agreed upon level you set. They can all perform there if you meet them where they're at to address their needs to hit that performance level, right? So again, the best human resources directors understand that and uh, bring new strategies to the table to constantly pay attention to where they're already getting a handful of applicants from. Are most of the people here hear word of mouth because we actually have really great retention already and everyone has been referred by someone else who already works here? Great, great. Let's focus on that, right? Let's focus on what that means to the company. Let's focus on why we we have three major contracts right um that will make or break if one or heaven forbid two of those contracts go away there will be a huge shift in what we're able to do right so they're able to look at that things that way right they're able to match um what you were saying i don't think there's any manufacturer that has customer service in in their lexicon right i think they have sales departments right um, some of them have entire departments, some of them individuals, some of them not, right? And it's, as you said earlier, the manager wearing uh, several hats across mm -hmm. the company, managing sales, managing employee satisfaction, managing production, and having to switch those hats throughout the day, right? Throughout the week, throughout the quarter. Um, but the ones that are fortunate enough to be structured and where they have someone focused on sales, I think even though still don't quite have a customer service thought process, in their lexicon. Um, I, I think, again, those HR departments working in tandem with the operations departments are understanding that you need to have um, a certain level of, you, you need to get rid of the dissonance between how your customers experience your company and how your employees experience your company. They should be one and the same. Um, mm -hmm. when I was in the hospitality industry working for that hotel um part of my role before becoming a general manager was becoming a brand and culture director and that was a snazzy term that not a lot of people understood but again it language is important 
the brand that the company expresses externally and the culture that we had internally needed to be managed, needed to be in tandem, right? If there was dissonance between us saying that we had a quality product, right, and a quality fun experience, and all of our employees were having a poor quality, terrible experience, they were not going to communicate our brand. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yeah. So that brand and culture directive really is about removing the dissonance between your external and internal, right? Um, so that the culture of your company is indeed the brand. That culture will dictate the brand, right? And you'll feel that in what I think you're asking about, Kurt, in, in that customer service, right? So it's less about the customer's always right and what are our strategies and customer service, right? It, it's less this idea of how people view table side service and things like that and more HR directors who are working towards getting rid of the dissonance between how companies are managing their relationships with their customer and how they're managing their relationships with their employees. Awesome. Another two. Yeah. Is that number four? Is that is that Mike? Right there. It is so yeah. that that has not been said on this show ever of how bridging those two together. That was just absolutely brilliant, Adrian. I just, mm -hmm. I just, I couldn't love that more. We have a couple comments here. I got to pull up here. Is it live or Memorex? Is that <laughs> the same gen as Kurt Anderson? A little Gen X reference there. So thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. So again, guys, if you can't hit your rewind button, just kind of drag that little button back and you got to replay some of this here. We've got a great comment here, Damon. We've got, that's exactly what some orgs are, organizations are naming that as talent capital management. Indeed. Indeed. And Aaron says, live the brand, grow the brand. So this is absolutely awesome. So, man, we've covered an absolute ton. I still, if you've got a few more, I know you're super busy and I, I, gosh, I could talk to you all day. We were talking about the blue economy before we mm -hmm. jumped off live. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. What I love what you were talking about. Hey, what's what's good for Rhode Island? Good for the rest of the country, right? You have some a lot of exciting things being manufactured in a great state of Rhode Island. You're also a coastal state. So, Aaron, talk a little bit about like what are some of the uh, really cool, fun projects or some of the cool uh, companies that you're seeing? Because you have a nice mix there in, in Rhode Island. What's going on there in that front? We do. We do. That's one of the great things we found uh, during our last major industry wide survey is that um, unlike several other states, there's not one single heavy driving force in yep. manufacturing. We, we cover a very wide berth of things. Um, you know, people might think of Massachusetts as synonymous with biotech or Detroit as synonymous with the automotive industry, yep. right? And, and rightly so, um, although there are also hundreds of other subsectors, right? There, um, there are clear driving forces in those towns. Um, here, we, we truly do do it all and, and it's so interesting to see um but pretty much you need it we make it here in rhode island <laughs> um so i'm sorry your your question was about yeah so we're, we're talking a little bit about like the blue economy so the energy sure. what is, so what is our it? sister yeah we, we have yeah. A, an entire sister organization devoted to the blue economy um because that's that's growing legs right um you have Offshore wind is, is a buzz that's on everybody's mind, but there's so much more to the entire ecosystem that makes up that blue economy, right? Anything ocean, right? Uh, you've got tons of local fisheries, right? Um, you've got you've got the science behind it. Um, we are a coastal town, as you said, you know, so we're also growing your mussels. You know, we're doing everything. We've got your mussels, your oysters, your fisheries. We've got all, all number of things, including the offshore wind as is big around the country. Um, Damon, you were mentoring, mentioning that you had some uh, offshore wind kind of uh, knowledge from out there in Seattle, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's happening all over uh, that the offshore power generation is, is really yeah. something. And, and you know, with with us here in the Northwest, we have such a fishing uh, heritage and, and the industry, and we support mm -hmm. a lot of the fishing that actually, because we're the first destination right. uh, south in the U.S. with the Alaska mm -hmm. efforts, and they're they it, it's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, when you when you drive, I mean, when you just see um, when you're driving by a quarter of a mile of of fishing nets along the road <laughs> that you know that that come back every year to get repaired and turn around and go back. Hey, you know, there's so much in the blue economy that we don't even know about. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, 
that's just the tip of the iceberg because we all think about fishing and aquaculture and things like that. Right. But the, the power generation and the other things that are coming from the oceans is really, really exciting mm -hmm. as well. So yeah, yeah. That's so we've cool got the entire sister organization for one technology nice. uh, devoted nice. uh, to that as well as driving technology innovation um, in other areas. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So what we'll what we'll we're gonna close things down here, Aaron. So as we come into the top of the hour, let's a uh, couple a couple last questions for you. All right. So anything new, exciting uh, summer plans like uh, going on at Polaris? Any events? Anything that we should be aware of coming up that you want to uh, promote or just share or just outside of just reaching out to you? Mm -hmm. Manufacturing day and dare I say manufacturing month yep. uh, will be upon us in the month of October. Yep. Um, I welcome any and all who have any zany ideas, the zanier the better, actually, um, for for how to interface with manufacturing, whether you yourself watching our manufacturer, uh, whether you, you have somebody who works for a manufacturer, whether you just have an interesting question that, that leads you to an idea that you think will would be interesting, an interesting way to connect with manufacturing. I want to hear it. Uh, we want to be involved in that rebranding of manufacturing in the state. We want to make sure that everyone understands the opportunity um, so that we can continue to help them gain access to it. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Aaron, Aaron's been awesome today. She's yeah, just putting this stuff in. Blue Economy, so good resource related to Blue, Blue Economy and what's going on in Rhode Island. And it's of course, she has my back. Told you. A little shout yep, out. She does. Green day, so we've got that coming up, and it's going to be here quick. So, all right, we've covered an absolute ton today. First off, I cannot express my thanks, my gratitude for your passion, your energy, sharing your expertise with us. I just absolutely love it. So, guys, again, as you're out there, and you know, the great thing for entrepreneurs and manufacturers, well, this isn't the great thing. The MEP network is a great thing, but so many entrepreneurs and manufacturers, they feel they're alone. They're on in a silo. Boy, their nose is to the grindstone, and they're just literally a lot of times just putting out fires all day. Like you just said, Aaron, you know, they're they're HR one minute, they're finance the next minute. Hey, I'll do some marketing and sales the next minute. Oh, by the way, now I need to worry about safety. My supply, mm -hmm. supply chain is, is, is a mess. So, you know, God bless our manufacturers. They're going through so much. And with the conversation here today, you know, you want to lean on other experts. You know, these are your trusted guides, your resources. You see the passion and the energy from a gentleman like Aaron, Aaron here, Aaron on the chat box. And this is, I'm, I'm telling you, Damon, we talked to new, dozens of, of folks from the MEP network. This is what we love to do is shine in a bright light on the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. And this is just, a, if this is your first time hearing about this, it's just a small taste of all the skills, the talent, and the expertise that you can capture at the MEP network. So, Aaron, you opened up the program talking about Sharon, God bless her, the, 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 the hero, the white knight, knight nightus, and I don't know, what, what would she be? So, the hero of your life. We're going to close things out. You talked about your seven-year-old, Avery. So it sounds like you have a lot of great things going on. And another, number one, one of your top priorities was balance of life. Mm -hmm. Last question for you today. Mm -hmm. You shared who is the hero as a young man growing up today where you're at. And again, you're just such a success. You're such an inspiration to us. Who inspires you? Who inspires you every day to just keep delivering great uh, your expertise, your superpowers, who's inspiring you today on a daily basis? My wife. Your wife. Oh, uh, right. what a great there answer. So, so brownie points here, but also, but also truth. Uh, my wife um, showed me how to actualize my values into a role, right? She's the one who helped me. Uh, make the move, not because I needed to to flee hospitality or because I needed to, you know, like re really um, look at my experience as negative at all, but rather as that next best step was to focus in on what part of what I was doing really spoke to my values, what part of what I was doing was the driving force, right? Um, I watch her every day be not not just an educator, right? And I say that to say that that term can be nebulous, right? An educator, most of us might think teacher and kind of leave it at that. She's been truly able to, to actualize her values within the wide world of education, doing so many things. She is a, uh, she's a consultant, right? 
She is an actual classroom teacher, now turned professor, right? Uh, she is one part of a team that runs an entire department at Rhode Island College, right? Um, she, she does usually about three things at once, occasionally only two, usually about three important things, <laughs> right, in, in their own right at once. And, um, and just watching that, it's, it's not about the, the drive and the hard work and the, right, and that, that bootstrapping mentality. It's not that that's so impressive to me. It's how she's able to do all of these very important things, always from the standpoint of um, what she truly believes is right and what she truly believes is useful to the rest of the world, right? So um, it's just an inspiration to watch and, and it's a great lesson. It's, it's a great model to have next to you when, when you're uh, yeah. comparing, you know, what you should be doing and, and how you should be spending your time every day. It's, it's great to have an easy reminder. Yeah, that's awesome. Mike, was that number five or six? I lost. Yeah, it's five. Yeah, it's five. Hey, Ren, <laughs> and the, the name of your wife, please. Rachel. 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 Oh, well, man, go. look yep. at these, these strong leaders, these women in your life, and what Damn. an inspiration. What a blessing. So mm -hmm. we give a huge mm -hmm. shout out, and, and Damon, he dropped it again. The next best thing was that the line. Yeah. Next best thing. So yeah, best I, thing. I, I think the three. I think we need to get T-shirts. The next best thing, and we'll credit. Don't you on that. that. I heard that on Brene Brown, which I welcome you all to go listen to Brene Brown's podcast. Um, and she might have heard it elsewhere um, because it just makes sense. It's one of those. It's one of those. You know, like don't worry, be happy. I'm not exactly sure who's the first to say it. You know, like I know this song. Yeah. So it's popular, but it's it's one of those things, right? It just makes so much sense that it's kind of hard to. Um, for any one person, I think to take credit for it, but yeah, no, just no. be the next best. Awesome, thing. you know, Brittany, Brittany, she gets tons. Of, you know, she's blowing it up on her TED talk and all that. She's got enough on her plate. We're yeah. we're we're going to give Sharon all the credit for this yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, you tell Sharon that we're get we're 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 saying that she's the originator of our new T-shirt line that we're going to launch, and we'll manufacture <laughs> them right in Rhode Island. So, yeah. all right, guys, we have one last comment here. I want to drop from our dear friend Aaron. And hey, Aaron, we got to have you on the program sometime, Damon. You would love to meet Aaron. She is so much fun ball of energy she's a marketing guru at the rhode island mep polaris if you will so aaron let's close out on this thank you thank you thank, thank you. you for sharing your energy your passion your family your expertise your story your history what a what a gem you are what a blessing this has been for damon myself and anybody out there listening so guys please connect with aaron connect with the polaris mep if you're coming to us from another state connect with your local mep we're going to close things out Damon, this week we have a big week. Aaron, yes, we do. down for this one. So on Thursday, we are interviewing Joe Foster, the founder of Reebok. Yes. The gentleman that founded, I just like, yeah. uh, dude, I just, I can't believe. Uh, incredible. The founder of Reebok, he and his brother started Reebok from scratch in 1958 built over, it took him decades. And it is a phenomenal story. It took him decades. He turned it into a billion dollar brand. And we are super blessed and fortunate. We're going to be interviewing Joe here right on LinkedIn Live on Thursday at 12 o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific. And this is what we love to do. Just interviewing manufacturing rock stars like Aaron, Joe Foster, and anybody else out there, just reach out to myself and Damon. We'd love to have you on the program. So Go out there. Damon, any parting thoughts for this wonderful Monday, June 13th? No, just go out and do it. Go out and do it. So, guys, go out. Keep spreading your awesomeness everywhere that you are. Keep loving manufacturing. Remember, manufacturing, all the cool kids are doing it. So you want to pursue yeah. that manufacturing career. Aaron, hang out with us for one second. And, guys, God bless. Have an awesome day. And we will see you on Thursday. So thank you, dude. Thanks so much, Aaron.